We're going to look at uh, the catechism, just the questions and the answers, and then uh, today I'll be sharing the basic gospel message uh, with us. So in question 27 and 28, uh, because it's very, it leads us to the basic message, that's why I'm going to be sharing that after these questions and answers. <coughs> so the question is, now where indeed Christ's humiliation consist? Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born and that in a low condition made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. Wherein consisteth Christ's exaltation? Christ's exaltation consisteth in his rising again from the dead on the third day, in ascending up into heaven, in sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and in coming to judge the world at the last day. Amen. Amen. Uh, before I get into the basic message, I just want to draw these two di diagrams. See, I'm going to use them in the end as well. So we have two things uh, in the catechism. The first one is uh, Christ's humiliation. And the other one is Christ's exaltation. Uh, so if you look into this diagram like this, uh, this being the start or the, the lowest point, uh, sorry, the, the, the start, and then here is the end. Um, and also applying the same into this other side as well. Uh, him being born, him being born, and then all these other events happening in his life, uh, finishing with the cross. Uh, that's how he was humiliated. Uh, the, the birth itself, the, the fact that he was born as a man, uh, that really humiliated uh, him so much. So in his birth, and then he went into that low condition. Even being born, if you're born in a noble family, uh, it's great, but he was born uh, into a very poor family, uh, also born in very poor conditions. Um, and then he was made to be under the law, right? All those who were humiliating Christ, uh, and then he went through all the miseries of life. He felt hungry, uh, he felt tired, and so on and so forth. Because the, 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 the reality of uh, his incarnation is not just like he came in a form of a man, but he actually became uh, like a real human being with a real body and a very uh, real human soul as well. And then... After all that, then he goes into the wrath of God. Uh, and then he's cursed to die on the cross. And then he's buried, and so on and so forth. So it begins uh, with the strongest of all humiliation that God uh, would take willingly upon himself, and then die on the cross, a very bitter and a very shameful uh, death uh, again. And then in his exaltation, it's not when he was raised from the dead, that is just the beginning of it. Uh, so that was very small when he just came from the grave, as we sing, up from the grave he arose, just coming out from the grave. Uh, for a human like myself, I'd be like, yeah, you know, like I'd be like jumping up and down. I'm like, this is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Uh, but for him, that is just the beginning of his exaltation. It's just a very small thing for him. But we know um, that many other things happened. Uh, he ascended into heaven, and then he sat at the right hand of God the Father, and is coming to judge the world. So when he's coming in glory, when Christ came in glory, that is the climax of his exaltation. Um, you'll not hear this from CNN or Fox News. If you're alive that day, you'll actually see him coming in glory. So those people who say that, oh, he came and is, in, uh, is somewhere in, in Brazil, they're just lying because we've never seen him come. Uh, when Jesus comes, his glory will be so, so, so clear. His glory is going to be very, very clear. And that's what we are waiting to see. Uh, we hope it happens right now, uh, but it's going to happen in his own time 
according to his plan. So keep this in mind as we go into the basic uh, message. And we're going to read together uh, the book of Genesis. Um, responsibly, if you can, please. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, and I'll begin with verse 1. <clears throat> now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the gardens. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and Let's he read seven, ate. seven and eight together. Then, then the, the eyes, eyes of both were opened, opened and, they and they knew that they were naked, and they, they sewed fig leaves, leaves together and made themselves unclothed. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Amen. Uh, there are questions in this world um, regarding happiness, regarding joy, maybe even peace, um, and is increasingly becoming a very strong question. Um, why is there no happiness? Uh, human beings have turned into becoming something very interesting. If you look in uh, In 2 Timothy as well, chapter 3, uh, in these last days, they're called, in the last days. Human beings have become increasingly uh, difficult to deal with. Um, increasingly, uh, you know, children even nowadays, when I compare kids today and kids when we were growing up, it was very different. I like going to the library in Worcester. It's one of, there's one of very beautiful libraries around there. It's called The Hive. If you happen to be around there, just pop in. It's a nice place. Uh, and then there's these teenagers that come there when they come from school, about like 20 or 30 of them. And I don't know the rules of change about libraries. I thought you need to whisper in libraries and respect other people when they're studying and reading. They just sit there and they just make so much noise. And it's not like they were having discussions or debates or forum or anything. They're just, they're just playing. It's very plain uh, what they're doing. And no one's going to say anything. All the adults, you can see the adults just cursing and you know, going to another floor, to another level. So people will just put you know, uh, headphones or earphones and try to cancel the noise. But you can't touch them. They become so powerful these days, children. Those are teenagers. I mean, even going down to even younger kids uh, today, uh, the world is uh, seeing um, a reality of things becoming hard and hard, at least until now. Um, I do, I'm very optimistic. I know going forward, things are going to get easier and easier. But at the moment right now, uh, we see that there is no happiness. Uh, there is no real joy. There's no real peace. Um, the number of people that are turning into things like meditation movement uh, is increasing and increasing uh, because they're looking for this something, you know. You, 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 all you knew is if you work very hard and get a university degree and get a good job and earn some good money, you're going to be happy. But even after going through all of that and having all those things in your position, um, there's this 
uh, emptiness or this unanswered thing, you know, like it's hard to explain, uh, but uh, mankind is still very unhappy in that sense. Um, Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, uh, showing us that Adam and Eve, they're walking away from the presence of the Lord God. From the Lord God. They're walking away from the presence of the Lord God. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to really say so many things now, but I just tried to make this point in the introduction, that when God uh, created man, uh, in Genesis 1 verse 27, it says that he made him in his own image, in the image of God. That's how God created man, in the image of God. Uh, in his likeness, it says, in his likeness. And what this uh, really means here, likeness here, talking about the attributes. In his likeness. God has two kinds of attributes. One, he has attributes that he shares uh, with us. And he has attributes that he does not share, with, not only with us, but not with anyone else. Only God can have those kinds of attributes. Like his attribute, his ability to know everything. His ability to do everything or anything. So in his uh, ability that he knows everything, there's no, there is no question you can ask God and he doesn't answer. In fact, he knows that you're going to come with that question. Uh, so, his ability to do everything, you know, his power is not limited by anything. He can do everything. His ability to be everywhere. The Bible does promise that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, God is there with them. So, even right now here, God is with us. But also God is over there. God is also over there. He is everywhere at every time. So, these are uh, incommunicable uh, likenesses of God or attributes of God. His power to transcend. This is only with God. And so on and so forth. Um, he, his nature that he doesn't change is the same. Throughout eternity is the same. Uh, we humans, we change all the time. But he has other kind of likenesses where God shares or shared with man when he when he made man. And these are things like holiness, uh, goodness, justice. So those kind of things he shared with us. And when we are with God, when, 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 the, when the image of God is not distorted in any sense in our lives, in Genesis 1, 28, you see that man has everything that he needs to live in complete joy, complete happiness, complete peace, and nothing is going to be lacking in any way. Um, but here in this passage that we've just read, a serpent comes to Eve and deceives Eve to do something. Now, it is vital to mention this. When God made man in his image and shared with him these attributes that he can, he can live in happiness, there was only one condition, and I think we did that in the catechisms as well a few weeks ago. The condition here uh, God gave a word in Genesis uh, 2, 16 and 17. And this is what God said. And I want you to uh, just see for yourself here. God said to him, you may eat, uh, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's what God said. 
It was a very crystal clear message, a very crystal clear uh, kind of a, uh, instruction or a command. But now if you go to Genesis chapter 3, the serpent, <clears throat> first of all, he said here he was a very crafty being. And then he comes to the woman, and this is how the serpent says to the woman, hey, Eve, go and eat the tree, the fruit. He doesn't say that. He says, did God say? Did God say? He makes you question the word. And then he, she, the serpent actually changes the, the premise. He says, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Did God say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve here uh, looks very confused. Um, she said, we may eat of the fruit <clears throat> of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, she says. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, which God didn't say this way, but it says, God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So she comes up with her own word, uh, and she looks very, very confused. And as a result of that, uh, what they do is, we've seen here, that they eat of the tree, and then they go from the presence of God, of the, of the Lord God. They go from the presence of the Lord God. Uh, they have to be with God in sharing these attributes to be happy, but they left uh, God. So what we see here is a few things. Why is there no happiness? Uh, why is there no joy? Why is there no peace? In simply put, why is mankind so unhappy? Um, it is because of a problem that is very fundamental. And actually, uh, life be begins to uh, become easier and, uh, you know, you, be you begin to see the possibility of you restoring even happiness in your life when you understand what the problem is, you understand the, you know, the fundamental problem. Because when you don't understand the fundamental problem, you can do all you're doing, it's not going to really help. If you look at my uh, left eye here, I've got a sty. It's actually, it's not a sty, apparently. So I've, I've done everything. People have told me, you know, put some tea in the freezer in the night, and then in the morning, first thing you do, put those tea bags on your eyes. I've done that. Uh, do this, do that, do that. I've gone to see a cosmetic, uh, you know, uh, specialist in, in Birmingham town, and she's the one that came up with a sort of like something that looks like an answer. Um, she said, you're just either tired, you know, go home and take care of yourself. So according to her, uh, that because I, uh, probably I sleep few hours than, uh, than many people, uh, so she thinks, my, my body is a little too tired. Uh, there's too much stress. And as she was saying, she was like, is, is it true? Is it true? And I said, yeah, it is true. You know, um, I think you might, you know, you might be uh, into something here. And she said, just go home. Take care of yourself. Eat well. Exercise. Sleep very long. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm pointing out on that is uh, you can do everything that you're doing. You can do all that you want to do in trying to solve your problems, but if you don't touch the fundamental uh, area where that problem is all coming out, you will actually never come to solve any problem. Uh, life has a fundamental problem. But what is it? What is that fundamental problem? <clears throat> in Genesis 3, 8, 1 is this separation. From God. And why is this a problem? It's because of this principle here. Uh, God made everything with a purpose. Uh, why did God make fish, for example? To fill the oceans and the rivers all over the world. Why did he make birds? To fill the expanse and fly everywhere, isn't it? Uh, why did he make grass and the trees and all the vegetation? to beautify the, the land. So trees must always be in the ground, fish must always be in the sea, 
birds must always be in the sky. That is the principle of creation. There is life that way. But if fish comes out of the water, the moment they just leave water, that very, very moment becomes the point of the beginning of their unhappiness. Maybe there is more unhappy things that are going to happen to them when they leave water. Maybe a fisherman is going to be walking around and grab it, takes it home, slash the, you know, the, the neck, and open the stomach and remove all the inside things and the, the guts and dry it and deep fry it and put it on the table and have lunch. All those things are very, very unhappy things. But the fundamental problem really was that fish, the moment it left water. Now, when you think of that, in a sense, that moment when the fish leaves water is not painful, right? It's not as what you think is going to be later on when somebody is going to slash its, uh, its neck. It's not painful, so it's easy to ignore. Uh, and there's a lot of fish, actually, some kind of uh, species, that they just jump outside, uh, you know, the ocean or not, most of the river, just jump outside and they, they do that. So that very moment, this very moment when mankind uh, departed from the presence of the Lord God, that very moment became the uh, root cause of all the unhappiness that Adam and Eve will be going through in their lives. And if you read the book of Genesis, you see a lot of that. Even in Genesis 3, later on, God speaks about how man will be working very hard and toiling the ground to just make a living. He has to sweat. How a woman will even have this issue of bearing children in pain. But all that was what was coming later. The very, very main issue is the moment they left God, that became the root cause of all their problems. And what happens? What happened when they left God? They left God with sin. <coughs> uh, original sin. So they became sinners. And Satan as well. This happened. They don't, happen to, they don't seem to know uh, what's working behind this beast here. But they went directly into becoming people uh, that now they began to live their lives under the influence of this enemy of God. Uh, these three things. Uh, separation from God, uh, sin, and Satan. Why is there no happiness? Uh, the Bible puts it this way. This is the answer. That man who was made to have a relationship with God has now left the presence of the Lord God. Mankind who was created for the very purpose of having fellowship, a relationship with God, has left God, has left the presence of God. Just like a small child, all they need is just to be at their you know, mother's hands. But the moment you take that child, let's say there is a baby somewhere and you think all this, all this, what this baby needs is nice necklaces. And so you take the baby shopping in Las Vegas and the mother is here. Um, and you buy that baby everything that you can put your hands on. Necklaces, all these baby things. You, know, you buy all of that and you just give that baby everything. Um, and also money. You, know, you take a lot of like, cash like, you know, sprinkle on, on our face and everything, um, the baby will still be unhappy, right? And the reason is, that baby at that stage, the only one thing she understands or he understands is just, is this my mom? Yes. They smell people, and I don't know how they do it. You take a baby and they begin to cry. Apparently they smelled you, and they knew that you're not my mom. <clears throat> um... And that is the principle that if you really want to find true happiness in your life, you have to really understand this principle. Um, that if you are a fish, I will take you back into the water. I don't know what's in the water over there. There are rocks, there is whatever, but I know you'll be happier there, even though there are crabs and other dangerous things. 
I can't take that fish and put it in the fridge. You can't do that because they're, not, they're never going to be happy. Even if it's safer in the fridge, it's cooler in the fridge. By principle, God made them to be in the water. Put them there. Forget about them. And so on and so forth. So the principle of the human happiness is a relationship with God. Even for you believers, I know this is a message we preach out there to non-believers, but I, I, there's no non-believer here. Uh, but also, I think by putting it online is a good content for them. They can actually come and hear. But even for a believer, if you don't have a working relationship with God in your, in your life, you'll also live your life like an unbeliever. Who is not happy? So the basic message of the Bible consists of three things. Number one, uh, understanding the misery of mankind. As a result of this, what do we see? Uh, John 8.44 became a child of the devil. Uh, it's so sad that for 19 years of my life I lived without knowing that fact. For 19 good years. What did I do then? I served the Catholic Church with, with my blood. So these are records that are there. You can ask my friends and other people. For 19 years, I didn't know that fact. For 19 good years. And strangely, when, when things look a bit difficult, I always felt like, but I've done everything, you know. I've done everything. Why is this happening to me? This is misery. Mankind who was created to be a child of God and live having a relationship with God forever and enjoying that, you live as a slave of the devil, as a child of the devil. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees who were like me back then. Secondly, your problem is not... Uh, finances, the misery of mankind is that he's spiritually dead. For 19 good years, I never knew that, that I'm dead spiritually. This is in the Bible. You are dead in your sins and in your transgressions. All kinds of mental problems. And I'm talking about things like anxiety. Uh, things like depression. All kind of phobias you can actually put there. Thank you. Phobia this, phobia that, phobia that. And there are quite a lot of these phobias. And what the world does, the world doesn't really solve the problems, they just put a name to it. They never really tell you why you're claustrophobic, why you have anxiety. It doesn't tell you that. It tries to help, but obviously because they're not touching the fundamental problem, they're not touching this problem here, uh, there is no way they can solve it. Um, all sorts of physical problems. Uh, this is not only the problem, but it is the afterlife problems. Seen in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 16. That if, if this life is all that we have, if you become so unhappy, you can commit suicide and die, and then it's finished, it's solved. But sadly, it's not the end. There is an afterlife, which is even more important. Inheritance problems. Uh, for references, we have them in the bulletin, Exodus 20, verse 4 to 5. Here we have Luke 16, 
19 to 31 or 30. Uh, if you look into, into this village in, in Samaria, it was filled with sicknesses and diseases, but when the gospel was preached, uh, they were happy again. The misery of mankind. So, the word gospel, obviously, means uh, good news. But the first point is mentioning into the misery. It tells you the bad news. And where is that bad news coming from? It's coming from here. This is a fundamental problem. But it doesn't leave you like that. If I only tell you the bad news, then it's very, very sad. But there's also the deliverance. How are we delivered? For separation? Now, I want you to see, we are being delivered. The, 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 the focus or the key of the, of the deliverance is not to deliver us from this, but to deliver us from here. Because if you're delivered from here, you're also delivered from this as well. I'll give you a very easy example. Let's say you have a, a mental problem, for example. And you, and you try to deliver yourself from that by seeing a doctor, which you, know, uh, you should and everything. But you'll keep on touching that forever and forever and forever. But if you get to the root cause of it and solve this one, even that will become an answer, in a sense. <clears throat> it's not going to be a problem anymore. So what do you need for the separation problem? Uh, you need the way. For sin, you need to pay for them. And here you need a uh, complete uh, change of identity. Now, the core of this good news is in the word Christ. If you're still in Genesis 3, we're going to read verse 15 uh, together. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Amen. The word bruise there can be translated into many kinds of uh, ways. My favorite one is crush. It's going to crush. Uh, it's going to crush your head going to bruise your head, going to put a very big mark there and crush it and bruise it. Uh, this is a promise that the offspring of the woman uh, will come and going to crush or bruise the head of the serpent. Serpent here uh, being Satan, the offspring of the woman coming and crushing uh, his head. That is the answer to the questions I was asking earlier. Because that offspring of the woman is coming to solve this problem of separation, of sin, and Satan. By separation, he simply is the way. The truth and the life. And how did he solve the sin problem? He paid for the sins in full. He paid for the sins in full. And I think we were looking at that today in the Hedel's uh, Catechism as well. That to pay this price of sin as an ordinary human being is impossible. Because that means you have to stand the wrath of God against sin. That's why God the Son coming and becoming that person that willingly receives the wrath of God the Father against sin is very, very important. Because he paid that price of sin completely and through his death and resurrection, <clears throat> he destroyed the works of the devil. He 
destroy them. Now, putting these three things together in one word is the core of the gospel, the core of this good news, and that word is Christ. As the way, we call him the true prophet. As the one who paid for our sin is the true priest. And the one who crushed the head of the serpent, destroying the works of the devil, is the true king. Amen. That's in the word Christ. And who is this Christ? Uh, is Mary the Christ? Obviously, no. Mary is the woman not her offspring. Mary is the woman. So one of her offspring is the Christ. So at least you have that hint, right? And there is no one else, obviously. The one who came, according to the scriptures, lived and died according to the scriptures and, and resurrected. Only Jesus um, is the one uh, that is the Christ. Now, how do we exactly get delivered from this? Uh, from the fundamental problem by understanding and accepting uh, this reality. This is not a myth, one of those fairy tales. It's a, historical, it's, a, it's a historical truth, things that unfolded through history, that Jesus is indeed the Christ. And that means that he's the one that solves the separation problem, because he is the way, he is the life, he is the truth. And he's the one that died on the cross of Calvary, though he had no sin, he died on that cross for me. You have to accept it like that. This is a very realistic explanation of the gospel. You're accepting this man was innocent. And it's in the records as well, even Romans, when Jesus died, they were saying, this man was, was innocent. Pontius Pilate himself, he washed his hands. and says, I don't, see, I don't see anything wrong with him. I don't see no sin. I don't see any sin in him. So these are important records in history. They accused him. The authorities listened to both sides and said, no, 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 we don't see anything. And he washed his hands. This man is innocent. So what took him to the cross to die, it is your sin. It is my sin. So when I believe that, I am the one that needed to be on that cross. But a man named Jesus was there on my behalf. He is the true prophet. He is a true priest and is a true king. True king here meaning that is the one that came to destroy the work of the devil. So when, when you find that believable in your heart, as the Bible promises, um, it is to believe, uh, to accept, and now even to confess. Not just confessing your sins, that is part of the confession, but also confessing that he is the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. You are my Christ. You know, accept. I accept you in my life. Come into my life now. I know. Accepting that. Accepting when he says, come to me all you who are uh, heavily burdened you know, and I shall give you rest. That is an offer. Accepting that offer and coming to him. But if, if you listen to all of that and, it's, and even you hear the offer that he's giving you and like say no, you refuse to believe in him, you refuse to accept him, and you refuse to confess him as the Lord, uh, then there is no salvation for you. Why? Because God has put it that way. To be as easy as that. And we humans are so complicated. When something is so easy, we become hesitant. You know, I think we like when we're being challenged by, by things. When something is so crystal easy, like clear and easy, begin to doubt it. That's why I don't listen to anybody uh, when I go to the marketplaces, like, you know, these big markets, and they like, come over here, you know, we've got this, this is very big. If you go there, they're going to give it for 500 pounds, 170, and it's yours. 
usually I begin to doubt, hmm, okay, uh, I'll probably come back. Because that, that's how we are naturally, it's just our own psychology. And as I explained the gospel earlier, um, that Christianity begins, be, begins here, begins here. The gospel calls us to come here first. And then uh, we go down uh, with the process of the gospel as it goes. So deliverance, John chapter 1 verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And then he says again in verse 13, children not born of the human will or of the flesh. It's not make a decision now. You realize you've been born of God. That's how you realize it. I've been born of God. <clears throat> uh, f- the final point of the, of the basic message in the Bible is uh, in John 1.12 and other verses in the Bible let me put it this way. Uh, from being a child of the devil into becoming a child of God, your identity has changed. Uh, that is a point of gratitude. Um, Following the trends of this world, following the spirit that is the spirit of the air, simply put, you're following Satan, that Paul was putting that in fancy words, uh, following demons, following the world, following trends. So that's how we lived. But now, the spirit himself dwells in your heart. Uh, here we have words like uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in your heart. Um, here we have many verses. Let me just uh, take this one, for example. Uh, John fourteen fourteen, that talks about the promise of Jesus himself that you can pray now. You can pray. And if you can pray, and you pray in his name, meaning for his own sake, you can ask anything, and he will do it. So we are, grat- you know, we are grateful for all of these blessings. That is why I'm always happy, even when I don't have any problem, in that state when I'm, everything is fine, I remember... Even if something happens, I can pray. So I'm always very comforted by the promise that if you pray, God will not just only hear, he'll also answer. And I've said this before, even if he just listens to my prayer, even that I should be very thankful. Just listening. Because um, someone else is praying to a wood or a stone or a tree. How sad is that? How sad is that? So, for me, I'm satisfied in the fact that he's a living God. Even just listening, I'm already so happy. Oh, did you hear me? Okay, fine, thank you. That's all I had, you know. But, look, he even answers, right? He even makes it happen according to the desire of your heart now, because the Holy Spirit is there. Before that, he doesn't want to do anything according to the desires of your heart. But now, even promising that he can do and fulfill all the desires of your heart. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you uh, grateful for that? So it's not about only when he answers and then, thank you, God, hallelujah. No. Just think about it. Does he have to listen to you? Who are you to demand that he listens to you? 
the fact that he's, he's, he's who he is and he just listens to you, know, to you, that is just a wonderful blessing. I can't even express how I feel even now just talking about it. Um, I have given you authority. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over, over all the powers of the darkness and nothing will harm you. That's what he says. Nothing will harm you. You have authority. Just confirm that so that I don't Psalm 34, yes, the angel of the Lord and comes around those who fear him and he delivers them. You know, people still, some theologians, they, they deny the works of, uh, of angels, but without seeing verses like this, you can't explain things that have happened even in church history. Even to this day, people don't know what happened to Martin Luther when suddenly he disappeared and he was found you know, still doing his work of translating the Bible. People had very evil plots. They pretended they have, they have released him. Okay, you can go. But on the way, there were people supposed to, to ambush him. Yeah, somebody must have known, this, you know, known the, you know, uh, the plan and sent another group to go and, and, and rescue him. But that's how God really works. Luther had no idea. He was walking into his death that day. <clears throat> the, the angel of the Lord and comes around those who fear him and he delivers them. So right now, above Erica's head, there are like millions and billions of angels going back and forth. Okay. Number six. Yeah. Though verse 21 really puts more emphasis on the fact that we are citizens of heaven, but I don't want you to get it in, in a sense of like, I don't belong into this world, I'm going. You know, I don't want you to think like that. A lot of people take Philippians 3, 20, whenever there's any problem, and say, but I'm a citizen of heaven, I'm, one day I'm going to go. You know. uh, no, we are awaiting for the Lord to come. So there is more reason of us enjoying this authority as we serve him and expand his kingdom, expand his kingdom here on earth. Finally, uh, Because I received the gospel when I was a young adult, and most of you are, you know, here are young adults. I can testify this. Hold on to this covenant of world evangelization. Make it really, really important in your life. And you see how the Lord is going to guide you and lead you into that. So, this uh, catechism of today, question, uh, the one we had 27 and 28, talking about Christ's humiliation and exaltation. Why did this thing really happen in history? It happened to unveil the gospel. And the basic of the gospel message you know, deals with these three things. Uh, and that is why it's very important for us uh, to open the spiritual eyes and see the misery if you don't see the misery of mankind, you don't need the gospel at all. And that's why it is a, it is a blessing, first of all, to, to have come to the point of just understanding that how pathetic on, and how miserable uh, is this incident here when they left from the presence of the Lord God. That was a very, very a miserable action uh, that caused the entire of humanity uh, it costed us uh, 
everything. And now God has given us the gospel, and through the gospel, uh, we can enjoy uh, his presence once again 